All right, now it's working. Sorry it took me a little bit to, to get started. Um, testing the microphones, didn't realize that it was working, even though it didn't look like it was. So, still learning. Um, today we're going to be focusing, or today we're going to be doing like a, kind of a color study for this tree painting. I plan to do a much larger version of it. I think it's such a cool scene. I took this picture in uh, Denver, um, and I kind of did some editing uh, to it in Procreate. Um, and the next step forward is doing a color study. So um, I'm stretching uh, some canvas, or just a, I've got a, a roll of canvas here, and uh, it comes pre, pre gessoed. It's oil primed linen. Uh, get it at Jerry's Artorama. And I'm just putting this on a board. So we'll get started shortly. I'm going to go down to the floor and just attach it to the board real quick, and then we'll get, we'll get going. All right, so I just attached uh, linen, oil prime linen to this wood board, just using some masking tape, kind of bordering it off. Um, so today we're going to be doing a color study for a larger painting that I plan to do of this tree. I took this picture in Denver, and I think it's going to be really cool. But before I start working on the larger piece, I want to make sure that I understand the general value structure and I can kind of solve a lot of the issues on a much smaller scale before I move up to something much larger. Um, so I'm going to put that there. And Adjust the camera real quick. Yeah, there we go. Okay, you guys can um, let me know how the audio is, if I need to change anything. Let me turn it down a bit. All right, and then we'll get started. Cool. Um, and during the stream, make sure if you, um, if you have any questions for me about the painting I'm doing or just about anything in general, painting related, um, just comment and uh, I'll be reading over uh, those, those comments and coming up with the best answers I, I have. Um, yeah, so let's see, let's make sure that you guys can see whole thing. Oh, 
looks good. There's the top, there's the bottom. So it's a little bit cut off, but that's not too bad. It's great. Okay, um, let's switch over to the palette. Um, I'm going to start laying out some colors. I just put down some Ultramarine Blue by Rembrandt. Um, and when I paint, I like to wear gloves. Um, tend to be pretty messy, and I plan to paint for the rest of my life. So I, I don't want too many carcinogens. Uh, don't want to be exposed to too many carcinogens. You know, I work with cadmiums and... I like lead paint. Um, lead white is incredible. Um, certainly not 100% necessary lead white. Um, if you're just starting out, I would not recommend using it. It's unnecessary, I think. You should be focused on painting opaquely for as long as possible. And then once you kind of get a hang of that, then you can move on to uh, transparency and painting in multiple layers. Don't worry about glazing any of that when you're first starting out. It's unnecessarily complex. But if you have any questions about glazing, you let me know. Because I, I certainly do it in my longer form work. So I just squirted out some raw umber. <laughs> Glad you're here, Olivia. Glad you could make the stream too. Tell your friends. Um, and also, let me just say, if you could like the video, that really, really helps me. Uh, it sends it to... Um, more people lets them know that I'm doing something right. Helps with the algorithm. So like the video, comment, ask me a question. Hey Molly, what's up? Glad you're here. We're gonna be working on this tree. Molly is a student of mine at the Art Students League. She also takes private lessons with me. She'll be coming here in the studio tomorrow, so you get to see this in person. Oh, uh, I just laid out uh, Viridian, and the one prior to that was uh, transparent red oxide. Now I'm going to do some yellow ochre. This yellow ochre is by Williamsburg. I wouldn't say it's my favorite. Um, I really like Williamsburg titanium white. That's a great, great color. And I plan to paint in multiple layers on this piece. Um, even though it's color study, I'm unlikely to bring it to my full satisfaction in the first, uh, during the first section. So I'm going to be using this Oleo Res Gel, which is an alkyd medium by Rublev. It just speeds up the drying time. So I'll be uh, including some of that in my mixtures. Um, love this color, Van Dyke Brown. I use that in dark mixtures where I don't want to go all the way to pure black, and it's warm. Kind of leans purple. It's pretty cool. Okay, next up, we got Naples yellow. Nice warm light. Okay. Ivory black, because I'm not afraid of it. <laughs> Some people are like, oh my god, don't use ivory black. It's the death of all color. That's good. You need to be able to neutralize things sometimes, so don't be afraid of it. Learn how to use it instead of fearing away from it. Turquoise blue, Rembrandt. Bloop. All right. What's up next? I got this huge bag of paints beneath me. I like to lay out too much, and I always end up using them later. All right, we got Cad Lemon. Windsor Newton. Indian yellow. This one's Williamsburg. Um, this one's a little bit more opaque than I prefer my Indian yellows, but it works. 
When it's on sale at Guyries, you pick it up. Okay. Not going to need much cad red. I already have some out there, so I'm not going to introduce any more. All right, we got this gun. Permanent Matter Deep. It's basically a lizard and crimson. But that's Rembrandt's, Rembrandt's version of it. Uh, let's see. Hi, everyone. Greetings from Costa Rica. I love zinc white. It's more transparent than lead white. I would love... Give me a second. Can't read the whole comment. I would love that some pigment scientist got the commitment to do less problematic. So I tried to make it less problematic. Yeah, he's referring to the... Uh, Diego's referring to the fact that zinc white tends to crack. So... Um, at least I think he is. Um, I try not to use zinc white because it cracks. Um, whenever I need a transparent color, I use lead white. Yes, it may be more transparent, but if your painting is cracking or worse, delaminating, I don't think it's worth it. That's just for me. Maybe I take myself a little too seriously. <laughs> okay, Williamsburg Titanium White. Put that guy here. Nice big pile of it. This is opaque, not transparent. Um, and uh, it's just titanium white. That's why I use this one and not uh, Winsor Newton. Winsor Newton has zinc in it. But um, what's interesting about zinc white is it actually is good for certain pigments. It, it uh, makes them more light fast. Okay, I'll put a little bit of Kremnitz white or lead white out here. Just a bit. So don't lick this part of the palette. You can lick over here, not the lead white. No, that's what you were thinking. Okay, I think with, uh, Felix says, I think with certain pigments, you can get away with using cheaper paints, titanium, I find basically performs the same from any brand as long as it does not yellow. Yeah, um, so the yellowing has to do with the uh, oil that they use. Linseed oil tends to yellow more. Safflower oil tends to yellow less, but linseed oil's um, paint bond or, uh, is uh, much stronger, and the yellowing doesn't really bother me that much. Uh, because it's reversible, you can put it in sunlight, and like if you're, you've got a, a yellow painting, you just stick it in the sun or in indirect sunlight, and then it should not be an issue at all. Um, yeah, and as long as it doesn't contain um, zinc, then I'm satisfied with it. Okay, so. Hi, Tanner. What do you think about the Im Impressionism and Claude Monet? I think this, this style is perfect for me. Well, your last sentence answers it. The style is perfect for you. So I think the, um, well, you, you can enjoy any style, but there are different, it's just different tastes, right? You tend to be drawn to uh, different colors, you tend to be drawn to um, different compositions, stuff like that. Um, for me, I appreciate Monet, but he, I would not call him one of my favorites. Um, I think, now this is a bit controversial, but I think he may have been a little lucky and a little too successful, so towards the later years, I think he kind of got a little lazy. They just, when I, when I go to the museum and I see them, some of them I find very impressive and interesting. I think the compositions are great, I like the lost edges. I like the broken color. I think that's super cool. Um, but sometimes it just feels like, hmm, this looks a little incomplete to me. It looks like he just put it out uh, on the canvas and maybe it just, it sold quickly. Um, I prefer to take things a little bit further. Um, and yeah, so just a, just a taste difference. Uh, it, I, it's not that uh, he painted loosely. That's not what I don't like about it. Because although a lot of my paintings are like much tighter, I like to use smaller brushes, um, and do a lot of scumbling and glazing. Um, 
I prefer the naturalists, that, that kind of style. But if I were to lean towards any, not an impressionist, but a, uh, uh, a more loose painter at, around that time period, I really like Antonio Mancini. I think he's fabulous. And so many painters love, love him. It's kind of a cliche now that uh, realist painters like Antonio Mancini, but good God, please go check him out. So if you like Monet, go check out Mancini. Maybe you'll like him too. He's more figurative. Um, I think I tend to like more figurative works than landscapes, which is funny because now I'm painting a landscape or something similar. Okay, so what I've done prior to this is I did a little comp sketch. So you can see that. Just a tiny little thumbnail where um, I focused on the light and dark pattern. So I'm going to be basing my, compos my composition based on this little guy. Um, really, my goal for these little sketches is when you squint, you should be able to see two clear shapes, light and dark. Um, you, I think the strongest paintings have a clear uh, light and dark design, and uh, that's what I'm going after. Um, we've got a light source that's coming in from the left, I've got cast shadows that I invented going uh, in this direction, and I need to keep that consistent. I even drew a little sphere up here. It's kind of hard to see. It's a bit overexposed, but light source is going down and to the right, and whenever I'm confused or worried about the light or where the reflected light should be coming from, I'm thinking about the direction of the primary light source, which is the sun, which is warm. So I'm going to have warm light, cool shadows. So in all of the darks here, I'm going to be pushing a lot of blue, a lot of transparency in there, a little bit uh, sap green and blue. We'll see. We'll play around with color. That's the next step. So I'm, I'm happy with this composition. Now we're going to test color. So there are no promises. This could turn out like crap, but I'm going to do my best. And uh, what's cool is I can test it out here, and I can let it dry. I can change it um, and get closer and closer to what my end goal is. And that way, I'm many, many steps ahead once I get the larger canvas out. OK, let's see. Got more people chatting it up. Glad to see you're back on YouTube. Miss seeing your videos. Ah, uh, well, yeah, I plan to, to continue doing this. Um, I'll be doing, m my goal is to do at least a weekly live stream. Uh, but I've also been filming some of the um, more uh, long-form, serious educational videos. Um, so those will be coming out soon. I feel like I've grown so much since my last video. Uh, my last video was uh, about frames that I had ordered. And the one previous to that, I think, was me going full-time as an artist. My gosh, guys, so much has happened since that point and now. One, I cut my hair. Two, um, I'm just improving every single day. And it's super exciting. So I, I appreciate you being here. and. Uh, I hope you keep coming back and ask me questions, or if you have any uh, video recommendations, uh, please uh, leave them in the comments. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. John. Hi, all. Hey. Uh, hey, Sylvie's back. <laughs> Thoughts on Bob Ross? I've heard different takes from different artists. Hmm. Well, Bob Ross made art for the masses, and I've been talking with a friend a lot about this. Um, so he made it accessible for so many people to, uh, to get into art. And that's what Bob Ross is great at. Do I think he's a great painter? No, I'm sorry, he's not. Um, but he's a great inspirer of, of uh, artists. So I think that's wonderful, and the world needs him. Um, OK, I'm going to start painting. I'll answer some more comments later. Um, let's see. So I've got my thumbnail sketch. There are a few ways I could go about this. I could do a very detailed charcoal sketch, um, but I think it's going to be much more exciting for you guys, because I know you're in the room, to um, just kind of go in straight with paint. Um, Usually I like to tone the canvas, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to selectively tone each area. I'm going to start with my lights, and I'm going to move into my darks. 
Uh, but before I do so, I'm going to establish a few lines with pencil. I think that's going to be beneficial. I'm using pencil, not charcoal, because the pencil is going to stay put. Um, and that way I can kind of establish, you know, some of the dominant diagonals and stuff like that. So I've got this, I've got my tree here. So I'm basing this off of the sketch. I've got this in my left hand and I'm looking for anything Trying to keep the tree gestural, I think it's pretty um, common to unintentionally make the tree really, really rigid. So I'm trying to find a fluidity to the growth pattern. Um, my mentor was uh, talking about trees and the way that they grow, and he found it appropriate to think of them kind of like veins. Um, and it's funny, as soon as he said that, it was like, oh, that's so obvious in all of, all of his paintings. He tends to kind of make them look like veins and arteries. Okay, putting in cast shadows here, cast shadow. And if I need to move the camera, I will. It's cutting off just a sliver of what I'm seeing, but it's not really that, that important. So my goal for this is to make it atmospheric and dramatic. So atmosphere comes with atmospheric perspective, right? I'm going to make sure I create as much depth as possible. And then drama comes with nice high contrast, think Caravaggio with uh, strong light and dark patterns. So I'm laying all this in. And I really like having a strip of light behind the tree. Now, I'm laying this in super, super light. I plan to change it as I go. And really, I just need these dominating lines. So, that'll do it. All right. So, let me switch over to the palette so you can see what I'm doing. I'm going to take some Gamsol. Uh, paint thinner and just kind of go over this whole area and I'm going to pick up some of that oleo res gel so that way this entire area is kind of covered in that alkyd resin so any mixture that I add to this it should dry pretty quickly so I'm actually going to start just like a watercolor light to dark and I'm going to put in a yellow light behind So I'm grabbing cadmium lemon, and this is just going to be a stain, just as an idea. So uh, yellow glows like no other color. So um, that's why I'm going to start with that. So you know what would help is if I actually had the reference image up myself. There we go. Oh, yeah. That's going to be cool. All right, so I'm working back to front and keeping this nice and thin. And yeah, this is super, super saturated yellow. But because I'm painting it nice and thin, I'm actually going to be able to wipe it off, uh, which will leave some of the, the dark, I'm sorry, uh, just stain the canvas. So I'm going to wipe it off after this. Like that. So diagonal right to left. And it looks pretty overexposed. So hold up just one second. We're going to change the exposure on this. Make it a little bit darker so you guys can see. So now I'm going to take my paper towel and I'm just going to wipe over that whole area so it, it's just the white of the canvas stained with a little bit of yellow. Okay, And I can change that a bit later too. Now we're going to switch over 
to the palette. And I'm going to mix up a, um, a dark mixture for the tree. Okay. I'm sorry. What did I say? I said back to front. So we're going to do the, f the landscape that is furthest away. So what is furthest away? It's the sky. So there's a gradation in the sky going from dark into light. So uh, blue into the light yellow. Um, I want to keep it as light as possible and keep it pushed really far back. So if this is my initial mixture, I'm going to yeah, grab a little bit of blue, but I'm also going to grab some turquoise blue, which has a little bit more yellow in it, and grab some white. That oleo-res gel, I'm going to thin it out. And I want to keep it nice and neutral and make sure it's light enough. So adding just a small amount of white, a little bit of that yellow. Okay. Now we're going to go back here. And I'm not going to go over the entire top half. I'm going to go over the sections that have the sky exposed. But I am going over the edges of where the tree is going to be, because I don't want there to be an outline where the tree is, where the foliage is, foliage. I want it to feel like there's a big cloud in that background going like this. So the yellow that I put in is going to be like the highlight on the cloud. I just accidentally dipped into some alizarin. Oops, no, that's okay. So I'm laying this in nice and thin. It has the oleo res gel in it. Okay, like that. And Wherever I see blue in those sky holes, that's what the holes are in between the tree branches. Okay. Now I'm going to take my fan brush. I'm going to jostle that back and forth so I don't really have many brush strokes. I want less information back there, more information in the foreground. Sorry if you can hear my dogs. I have a few studio dogs. They're my besties. They hang by me all day long. Except when I'm live streaming. Um, I've got German Shepherd Husky Mix, and her name is Remy. And then I have another dog named Watts, named after none other than Alan Watts. <laughs> Shows the hippie in me. Um, yeah, they're both incredible studio dogs. All right, so comment. Let's see, Rob asks, are you able to recommend a good book for learning to draw, please? Absolutely, I have so many book recommendations for you. Um, one of them <clears throat> depends on what you want to draw, but essentially all drawing fundamentals are the same. I've seen um, a really good one by Juliet Aristides. It's a uh, classical drawing atelier. Or atelier. Um, yeah, that one is superb. It's such an incredible book. I learned so much from that. Um, you could just, it's like a, a textbook. You just do. Um, Start to finish, the beginning of the book, it has very simple exercises that you can go through, and it slowly progresses into more and more complicated things, and it's a full series that you can get into. Um, so anything by Juliet Aristides, excellent, excellent stuff. And I learn a lot from video, so definitely go online. Um, I'm sure you're aware of Stan Prokopenko. He's got, like, the best videos ever, him and... Uh, Stephen Bauman has excellent videos. Uh, my friend uh, Patrick Okraniski, <laughs> sorry Patrick, <laughs> um, he just started a YouTube channel and he is doing 
uh, landscape videos. So if you want to learn landscape painting, go to him. Um, but yeah, your question was drawing fundamentals. That's a great book for that. Classical drawing. New hair, new year, new tanner. That's right, Olivia. Thank you. I'm a different person now. Okay, so I'm mixing up a new color. This one uh, has a little bit of ultramarine blue, a little bit of transparent red oxide, okay, and some white. And what I'm doing is I'm creating the first tier of depth in the distance. I want it to be nice and atmospheric. So this color cannot be um, too green, right? This is the first tier of trees. So I want it to feel green relative to the rest of the landscape. But if I make it too dark and too yellow, it's going to come forward too much. So we're going to start here, and we'll change based on our needs, right? Again, I'm introducing a little bit of that oleo res gel. And when we come back here, um, I'm going to place that in as a test. I want that light to really feel vibrant. So as I scrub this in, I'm creating some softer edges against the cloud. And it seems pretty dark. But I know, based on the color on the palette, that it, it's still, uh, it's quite light. Hmm. Sorry, I think my microphone is talking to me. Or I'm going insane. Scrubbing it in, keeping this nice and thin, assuming that this is going to be close, but I don't know about you, but I always make a mistake the first round. So I plan to change it later. It'd be wonderful if everything was perfect the first go around. Okay. Like that. Take my fan brush. Knock down some of those brush strokes. Simplify. Give the illusion of texture. I can even use the fan brush to scratch away at it. It's just kind of a, dare I say, Bob Ross technique. Hope you're still there, Sylvie. <laughs> okay, let's see. Yellow is just simply the best color. I love Sprick's yellow skies. Ah, yeah. Yeah, yellow is incredible. Um, yeah, it glows like no other color. So now what I'm doing is I'm taking the fan brush and I'm kind of moving it up and down and giving some wispy um, tree-like textures along that edge up against the cloud. Okay, so we're working back to front. These should be nice and light. And as trees go up and into uh, into the sky, they get lighter and lighter. The light kind of bends around them. Think of like a cone. As it goes up, uh, the light can travel around it. Okay. I don't want these to look too similar, so I might use my thumb and scratch away at some of it. That should do. All right, let's see. Um, awesome, thanks. I will buy the Classical Drawing Atelier by Juliet Aristides. I do want to learn the academic style. Well, that is a wonderful book for you. Um, if you want to get into, let's see, what's another go-to? Um, there's a figure drawing book by, um, uh, what's his name? Anthony Ryder. I love that book, too. That's a, that's a really good one. He goes over uh, different pencil techniques, like cross-hatching, um, and the way he um, creates form using cross-hatches. I think that's a super useful book as well. OK, we're going to move on to the next tier of depth. And um, I'm also thinking light to dark, right? So I'm actually going to establish the light shape here in that tree. And 
introduce some of those greens. Yeah, I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to do the shadows behind that. So it's both light to dark, but then also back to front. So you kind of switch between the two, because these lights are in front, but it is lighter. Um, so we'll switch back to the palette, clean my brush. I'm creating sections. Okay, I'm aware of every mixture that I'm putting into this. Um, we're going to get some Kremlin's white, sap green. And I'm going to neutralize it with a little bit of raw umber. A little bit more white. Now, we have one light, cool shadows. So this green needs to be warm. And also I'm thinking for the future, back to front, these are going to be the leaves sitting underneath the highlights. They're still in the light shape, but they're not going to be super, super light. Introduce just a touch of black. Okay, that's a little too extreme. Let's get some white out. I like to keep things pretty darn neutral. Helps with color harmony for me. Getting Oleo Res Gel, thinning it out, not too much. Uh, Let's start there. Back here, going over the light shape. My goal for this stage is just to cover the canvas. Okay, this contains more yellow, so it's going to come forward, right? Compared to those, those have more blue. And Squinting down, trying to find those shapes. And I like to work in layers, so that's why I'm using this fast dry media medium. Uh, Sylvie says, Studio Dog Reveal. Well, if that dog ends up in the area, if uh, Remy or Watts comes in, I'll, I'll have to show you guys. Okay, there's a light spot here. I want to link up these lights as much as I possibly can, and I'm definitely not a slave to the photo, right? I need to um, design these lights a little bit. So I'm seeing a natural like diagonal like this, and I want to make sure I create that diagonal too. Can't forget about that. Okay, we'll leave it there. Soften this a little bit. Create some irregularity. Okay, so I'm actually going to do this back here because that is certainly further away. Um, so it's in the light, bring it back to the palette. It's in the light, so it's going to be warm, but it's further away, so it needs to be cooler. This is um, my tree, my tree value, so I need it to be lighter than that and a little bit warmer relative to just this mixture. So I'm adding white, which is cool, introducing it to that mixture. Maybe bringing in a little bit of this sap green from my foreground tree mixture. And I want to keep it pretty darn light, but compressed into that distance. Okay. I like neutrality. And if I'm going to lean one way or the other, uh, darker or lighter, I'm going to keep it darker because I like to paint multiple layers. So when I paint multiple layers, I can glaze in some more vibrant colors if I want. Oh, I like this. I like that. Okay, so I'm going to go all the way across. 
scrub that in. And keep those edges nice and soft. Right, to create atmosphere, you want your sharper edges in the foreground, generally. Kind of a good rule of thumb. So although I can see a distinct difference from the, uh, the ground plane and the tree plane, I'm kind of keeping that softer. There's still a clear shape to those two, but I kind of want to compress that all into, into one <laughs> as I fall into the canvas. <laughs> Hi from Lahore, Pakistan. I'm sure I butchered that place, I'm sorry. Hi, how are you? I'm glad you're here. That is so cool. Glad to have you. Oh yeah, painting. Oh yeah. Okay. So, next tier of depth, I think I'm going to put in the diagonal of the road going this way. It's kind of a purpley tone, um, so let's switch back to the palette. We're going to, first I ask w what value is it? Is it light or dark? Well, it's dark relative to what is back there. So we're going to make a dark mixture. This is my distance. I'm going to grab some Van Dyke brown. It's not anywhere close to black. Black is only in the foreground. Okay, and I want it to be darker than my trees. But I still want room to get darker, so color is going to be doing some of the work here. I want it cool to stay away from us. Warm things come close. Okay, I think I like that. We're going to make sure we include some of this oleo res gel so it dries quickly. And we only want it to lean purple. I don't want it to, I don't want you to look at this and be like, wow, look at that purple line. No, that's not the point of this painting. The point of this painting is look at that tree. That's my focal point. So I want to understate any, anything like that. The most saturated colors are going to be in not just the tree, but really the diagonal and the clouds. So I might come back and make that more intense. Okay, let's go back here this diagonal and I'm gonna add a little bit of Gamsol to make the paint flow a little bit better and I'm already seeing that this looks pretty dark oof way too dark so back to the palette we're gonna lighten it got this mixture here I'm gonna keep some of it so I'm aware of how dark I actually went added a little bit of titanium white which titanium white is very um, a very strong white. So when I add a little bit, it's going to make it a lot lighter, really, really fast. Ooh, you know what? It could be exactly the same value as those distant trees. And it's still going to show because it's lighter than the foreground element. So let's put that there. Ooh. Oh, yeah, I like that. Thin it out a bit. And... See how I'm not worried about the tree in the foreground? I know it's going gonna, it's gonna to be there. But this is the benefit of working back to front. Because that tree in the foreground needs to relate to everything happening behind it. And I'm not a slave to the reference, so I'm not too worried about making it exactly like it. Okay, I'm going to take my fan brush. I'm going to jostle that edge. And... Make sure that sinks back there. Okay, I like that. I've kind of created a more dramatic uh, angle to it, which I, I think I like. We'll find out. Okay, let's uh, switch back here. Um, next up, let's put in, let's get crazy and do this background mixture so it needs to be really really dark and certainly cooler so here's my lights we're gonna go nice and dark I'm gonna grab ultramarine blue 
which is transparent. I'm going to grab Van Dyke, which this has made an extremely dark mixture. I don't want that to be that dark. But what's cool is with transparent colors, when you scrub it, it gets lighter than it is here. So let's test that. It's really dark, but if I scrub it around, it's going to lighten up. And I know it looks really, really dark, but I assure you that because it doesn't contain any black, I know that I can go even darker. Scrubbing that in. Leaving some of the, um, that sky. brush. And the foliage goes behind one of the branches. So I'm going to scrub that in and I'll be laying down a branch in front of that, back to front. Transparent colors tend to sink back too. So um, by scrubbing this in, it reveals the transparency in, in these colors. And they're in shadow, classical drawing, classical painting rule, is to have transparent shadows and opaque lights. So it's good to have. So again, if you guys have any questions, make sure to ask in the comments. I'm, uh, I have the chat pulled up, so if you have anything you'd like advice on, or if you're like, why in the world did you just do that? Put it in there. Or if you have a random question, ask me. Go for it. Um, we can talk more about Monet if you'd like. So, <laughs> um, yeah, Monet seemed like an artist. He was an artist for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, everyone has different tastes. And I, at the same time, are very... There, there was overlap with the, the French naturalists at that same time. And most people know of Monet, but they don't really know about Bastien Lepage, whom you should check out. I tend to prefer painters who have a more neutral palette. It's just an aesthetic preference. Um, I really like uh, the Russian painters, like Isaac Levitan. Actually, when I saw this, this tree, it reminded me of Isaac Levitan. I was like, oh man, maybe I could you know, study his work and learn from, from that. So notice how I'm varying the brush stroke. I'm dragging it and pushing it and pulling it. Okay, by doing this, you can kind of create a leafy texture without painting individual leaves, because gosh, that's obnoxious. I know, Main, I know Monet sold out. How about other impressionists like Van Gogh? So Van Gogh, um, he was 
He certainly didn't sell out, did he? <laughs> Talk about classic struggling artist. I think he's most famous because he is that classic story of the starving artist. He sold, what, one, maybe two paintings. And I really like Van Gogh as an artist. I think he was you know, truly trying to push, push himself to be better and exploring art for art's sake. I think that's wonderful and super inspiring. I've read Dear Theo probably, Dear Theo, like five to ten times. And I know that's broad. I don't even know how many times I've read it. And that's because I listen to audiobooks while I paint. <laughs> so um, one thing I used to do is when I'd go out painting outdoors on location, I'd put on that, <laughs> that audiobook and just listen to, you know, Van Gogh struggling, and I'm like, yeah, I'm, in a, I'm an artist too. I'm struggling. This landscape is super hard. And hearing him talk about, you know, life and philosophy and um, everything that he was going through, I'm like, geez, you know, maybe I have it easy. Um, yeah, oh, I'm I'm really liking this texture. I think that's working. Um, and I actually forgot this tree down here. It's kind of a third tier of depth. I'm not sure. I kind of want to push it into the distance because it's behind this tree, and I don't want it distracting from this. In my preliminary sketch, I kind of have it fused with this foreground tree. So I might actually introduce some leaves kind of drifting in that direction, like this, roll them that way, and then... Um, combine them with the tree here, like that, because it is going up in front of this road, this trail. This is uh, City Park, I think I took this picture, in, uh, in Denver, Colorado. That's where I live. Um, let's see. Do you have a favorite type of drawing, such as sight size, comparative measuring, or any other type? That is an excellent question. I uh, first learned sight size drawing, and that was excellent. I felt, you know, really, really exciting to learn to draw what I was seeing. But shortly after starting that, I realized, oh, dear, this is uh, not very useful in the majority of circumstances. It works when you're in a studio with a plaster cast and you know you're you know you're drawing from something that's staying very, very, very still. Um, but it, it was a really good way to introduce myself to the concept of measuring, uh, which I found so, so useful. So I, I'd highly recommend learning sight size, but once you do a few sight size drawings uh, in like barg barg plates, that kind of thing, and from plaster casts, I'd recommend you expand uh, your expertise and start practicing with uh, comparative measurement because uh, you're going to find that you're not always at the perfect distance from the model uh, when you start working on other subjects. So right now, I definitely use comparative measurement significantly more than I use sight size. In fact, I can't remember the last time I used sight size. Creating texture of some of the leaves dropping behind the um, <coughs> the uh, branches. Let's see, Ukrainian flag. Woo -hoo! Oh, you know, one of, uh, there's an artist I follow on Instagram who is from Ukraine. Oh my gosh. So incredible. His landscapes are insane. On one of the breaks, I'll, I'll look him up. Because um, you guys have to go check this guy out. He kind of, in, he paints uh, these loose landscapes that are just extraordinary. They feel so dynamic, so real. 
I'm obsessed with him. So the paint is already getting quite tacky, believe it or not. Using this uh, oleo res gel, I feel like it um, it dries almost faster than liquid, which is pretty wild. Um, speaking of liquid, if you haven't seen my liquid video, it just reached 50,000 views. <laughs> pretty exciting. That's definitely my most popular video. Which is funny because uh, behind the scenes, um, that day I was like, geez, what the heck do I make a video on? I have no idea. And I'm like looking around the studio, I'm like, liquid? I guess. I use it all the time. And just cranked out that video really quick. And then it turned into something that really people really liked. All right. So now we're going to start working on the, the foreground here because it's behind the tree. There's this nice, beautiful cast shadow right here. So as we get closer, we're going to get more and more saturated. Um, so let's switch over to the palette. We've got uh, our dark mixture of the trees back there. We have our dark mixture in, uh, in the tree looking up above. This plane is being exposed to a lot of ambient light, a lot of light uh, bouncing around. Uh, the majority of the light hitting in the shadow is actually from our secondary light source. Our secondary light source is the sky itself. And that's why when we say we have warm shadow or warm light, and we have cool shadows, we, we grab some blue. The shadows are blue because our secondary light is illuminating that area. Secondary light, the sky. So I'm going to grab some sap green because that's kind of our harmonizing green in this. I'm going to grab a little bit of white. I keep grabbing my lead white, which, guys, I should be saving some money. I should not grab that stuff. It's so expensive. So it is in shadow, so we need to make sure it's dark. But if you're out in the world actually viewing a landscape from life, Shadows are not that dark, and they are quite luminous. Whereas when you're looking at a photograph, all the shadows are compressed, and they're really quite dull. So because I've painted outdoors and s observed shadows quite a bit, I know to put in some exciting colors in there. Nice, cool blue. We can start there, I can change it later, and it looks quite dark on camera. I think uh, I'd say it's a value or two higher on, uh, from life. Uh, Rob, awesome, thanks Tanner, no problem dude. Um, the liquid video was my in introduction to your channel, and I loved, you said don't use more than 20% liquid for archival reasons. That's right. So, yeah, you don't want to overdo the liquid, dangerous stuff. and. I showed you the proper way to use liquid, right? You pre-mix all of your colors and then you do it. So I want to point out, look, I am not properly using oleo res gel. I'm dipping into it. I'm not really worried about the archival uh, properties of this particular painting. It's going to be fine. It's on loose canvas, which is already a problem. If I really love this painting, I thought it was incredible, I want to sell it, someone's really interested, which, by the way, all of these are for sale. If you're interested, um, you can DM me on uh, my Instagram, which is at Tanner Steed Art. All the demos are for sale. Um, and, or you can just comment down below and we can get in touch. But uh, because this is on raw canvas or just loose canvas, it's not archival being so flexible. So if I were really uh, excited about this, if someone wanted to buy it, I would secure this to a hardboard panel. Right now it's taped to one. But I would actually use archival glue to, to adhere it, adhere it to that. Okay, gonna thin out my paint a little bit. We're gonna put in this cast shadow. Just test it out. Value first. Hue second. Chroma third. Okay, I'm liking it. The shape is getting there. I'm gonna rough up this edge. Get 
bringing it up against that road. I don't want to leave any white on that canvas. Okay, I like that. And I'm also going to cast shadow down here, which I might scrub that in a little bit. Okay, to create kind of a grassy texture, I'm going to uh, remove some of it, creating a semi-opaque, semi-transparent mixture by just kind of scratching away at it. using my fan brush. And then I also have cast shadow kind of going like this. And these cast shadows were uh, invented. I wanted to create kind of tension going up against this tree and uh, try to mimic some of these uh, tree branches going in the same direction. So also, something else I offer is um, Zoom lessons and critiques on your paintings. I use Procreate regularly. Um, and on Procreate, there's this really cool feature that if you were to, let's say, take a picture of your artwork and you wanted a, me to critique it, I could take it and draw on top of it and uh, record the entire process of what I'm uh, thinking would be good changes to make your picture better. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, you can email me. Um, you can find that information on my website, tannersteedart.com. Um, I have someone who's just starting Zoom lessons from Ohio. I met her um, in Italy when I was there this last year, which is really cool. Put in some cast shadows in this tree. Okay, I like that. Um, I'm going to zoom out for you guys so you can see the foreground a little bit better. Make sure this is nice and in focus. I apologize. Okay, now you can see that diagonal a little bit more. So now I'm going to put in the grass color here. This is the closest object to us, or the closest thing to us. So. I'm going to crank up my saturation, not to pure cad lemon, not yet, but I'm going to see how much I can push this. I want to make it nice and light. So I'm going to grab my white cad lemon and maybe a touch of sap green. I love sap green. A little bit of raw umber to neutralize it. Keeps it nice and warm. And I also don't want it to be too light um, because I want you to focus mostly on the light in the sky. So we're going to test this out. It might work, might not. I can always glaze on top of it. Remember I was saying earlier that I like to um, keep things lighter and then slowly darken, right? I like to keep them lighter. Let's see. Okay. So it's a little vibrant for my liking. It looks even more vibrant on the, um, on the camera. So you might want to say that. I'll lay it in. I'll establish all the other elements first. And then I'll return back to it. So I'm creating a soft edge with this cast shadow. As cast shadows recede from an object, they become less and less intense. And I'm also 
kind of flicking the brush here, creating some dappled light um, in, in between some of the leaves from that distant shadow tree. So you can see why this is so beneficial to work back to front. So you can make a shadow feel more distant from the object if it has a uh, larger gradation going from light into dark. Okay, uh, Rob, thank you. That's so nice. I'm liking it too. So I don't want to create too much tension at this part of the canvas. I'm kind of darkening it and bringing some of that um, shadow color into the light. I still have some of the canvas showing through in the, the distant foreground. I want to make sure that distant foreground feels like it relates to this that distant foreground, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, the distant ground plane needs to relate to this. So do you see how the, this is kind of disharmonious, right? Uh, this is way, way, way too saturated compared to what is further back there. So I can do one of two things. I can introduce some saturation back there, which I just tried. This is why I wear gloves. I like finger painting. I'm just patting it around, kind of mixing it into that distance. Or I could have neutralized this. Okay. Now I'm going to be drawing in the tree here, so I'm actually going to scrub out this area. And draw using my paper towel like this. Try to make it so it's. There we go, like that. Okay, we're gonna return back to this foreground. It's not awful. I'm just uh, trying to avoid something that's garish or t just too saturated for m my preference. That road is a little too big, too. I want it out of focus as well. I want the tree to be the most, most in focus. And I tend to use the, pa or the painting as my palette as well. So I'll pick up color from one area and bring it into another area if I find that it's useful. Okay, I'm gonna take a step back. Uh huh. It's working. Okay. Um, could be interesting to create kind of a harder edge in the sky later on. Um, and I can use my thumb to soften some of these edges between the sky and um, the the tree. Like that. So I'm softening against the shadows because those are the most distant. And I don't want to overdo it. That was a bit much. Okay. All right, let's try. If you are just joining now, it would be so, so helpful if you like the video. Um, make sure you're subscribed, of course. Um, I do these once a week, and I'm also working on some long-form videos. I just finished recording one with a, uh, like a, uh, the working title is How to Make Drawing Details Easier. So 
when you have a really, really complicated subject, um, I should probably come up with a better name for that, or a better title for that one. Um, when you have a really complicated subject, it can be pretty intimidating, especially when it's, you know, knots on a carpet or, um, or on a rug or painting a tapestry with a bunch of details, a bunch of paisley pattern, which is what I do in this portrait. Um, I have kind of a pretty, I've developed a pretty solid system to solving that. So, hope you'll join. Um, why do some artists do a grisaille? Is it just to establish values and does it make painting easier? Yeah, so artists use grisailles to separate it, uh, separate the process, the procedure of the painting. They worry just about values. So it's like um, a good transition if you are just drawing and starting to learn to paint. Uh, when you're just drawing, you're just worried about light and dark, right? What is lighter, what is darker, and then plane changes. Uh, Grisaille allows you to transition to a different media, but you're worried about the exact same problem, light versus dark. Um, so um, if you solve all of the drawing issues and all of the value issues, your painting is going to feel real already, and that's why drawings work. Um, color is never going to save your painting. It's only uh, going to make it you know, even more exciting. Um, so it's a really good idea to start out by doing that. Um, it just breaks it down into simpler steps. Okay, so now I'm going to scratch my brush to kind of give myself a guideline. Pulling my brush, this is how I draw with charcoal, and kind of establish a gesture for one of the branches. Okay, here's another one, like this. It's going to come down and go like that. This is kind of a center line construction. So if you've ever seen that with a portrait, center line construction, that's what I'm thinking. With these lines. Now I'm actually going to be teaching a class soon on Zoom that is all about uh, grisailles, painting with just two colors. Uh, white and raw umber, and then uh, we'll slowly introduce uh, other colors and build up to a more complicated, colorful picture. So if you're interested in that, make sure to get in contact with me, because that's about to start very, very soon. Wow, this tree is so... Beautiful. The gesture is just amazing. Wow. Okay, so I'm going to establish two values for the tree, light and dark, not worry about any of the details. Um, and because I'm going to be painting in multiple layers, and you're not going to probably see the next session, um, I'll be posting it on my Instagram, probably on my stories. So if you follow me at Tanner Steed Art, you'll be able to see like the finished version of this. I'm, uh, so I'm going to be painting in multiple layers. So during this layer, I'm going to try to get as close as I possibly can and kind of build up the texture. Um, and that way, when um, I work on a later layer, I'll have that texture underneath to kind of help with uh, the illusion of detail in this, in this tree. So I'm going to start with shadow value first because we're working back to front. Um, yeah. I enjoy painting trees. Each one is so different. Yeah, they really are so, so different. Um, they each have their own character. So um, I'm going with the closest thing to it. First, I'm going to ask myself, is it light or dark? It's dark. So grabbing some Van Dyke brown. Um, I'm not grabbing the ivory black on its own. And I want to make sure that it isn't really, really, really dark. Um, when you're painting from life, you're going to be able to see into those shadows, right? So the colors are going to be more vibrant, and you're going to be able to see 
exactly what those limbs are, are doing. So I'm lightening it significantly using my titanium white and cooling it off with ultramarine blue. Got a little bit of raw umber. I'm going for a neutral blue-gray. Okay, that leans purple. For some reason, I just feel the purple. And um, it's also being influenced by environmental light. So you gotta think what the sky, or the, the light from the sun is hitting the ground and it's bouncing up into the tree, right? So some of these branches are going to be experiencing a little bit of a green shift because the light is hitting the ground and bouncing up into them. All of the planes that face the ground are going to be receiving this reflected light. So I'm going to start with this uh, overall value, but then as I try to create three-dimensionality in these cylinders, because that's really what they are, um, I'm going to uh, calculate the local color in the shadow plus the reflected light. And that's complicated, but that, that's what it is. So here's my first guess. I'm going to switch back over here. <clears throat> I heard recently that some artists purposely reduce the number of values in their painting, but it didn't say why. Is a painting using all 10 values of tone a bad idea? So uh, you know the idea of less is more, right? So when you have less values, the idea is that uh, it will have a stronger composition. There's uh, a clear motive for what you should be looking at and what you shouldn't be. Um, and a strong composition is really just uh, an abstraction of strong and in an interesting arrangement of light and dark. That's it, just two values. So when people see that, it's kind of going on um, a more advanced way of viewing composition and viewing a painting. So if that doesn't make sense right now, don't worry. There's enough things to focus on. First, learn how to draw, right? That's the most important thing. I, I think it's really funny when people say, you know, they'll, they'll want to take a painting class with me and they're like, oh, you know, I want to learn to paint, but, you know, I don't really like drawing, so I don't want to draw. It's like, oof, sorry to tell you, first lesson of painting class is that drawing is painting and painting is drawing. You have to understand the fundamentals of drawing in order to paint. In this class, in this style, I guess. And of course, if you're here watching this video, you're probably interested in that and not um, maybe too much of the throwing paint on canvas. Okay, so I'm, even though there are so many intricate shapes and intricate color values in here, I'm simplifying into just two. Is it in the light or is it in the dark? because I want to create a harmony amongst all of the shadows of this tree because it has a local color, right? Local color re refers to the color that when I point to this grass, I say, what's the local color? What's the color of that? You'll say, what? Green, okay? Local color of this is green and it's influenced by uh, the light source and the light in the environment reflecting. Um, anytime, Rob, I like your questions. Keep throwing them out. So I'm getting a bit slower, right? There's no rush. I'm glad I scratched out those lines because they're kind of acting as a guide. What's funny is some of my decisions, I'd say most of my decisions now are kind of intuitive. You know, I'm like, oh, I need to do this thing. I just do it. Um, but that just comes from a series, many, many trial and error, failed paintings, starts. There's the 10,000 hour rule, it really should be for art, you should do 10,000 paintings or 10,000 starts. You'll get a lot more out of that. Okay. Let's 
process here. So I'm painting in the, uh, the plane that's immediately beneath this tree branch, that cylinder. And then I'll worry about the light. Making sure that I have oleo res gel in this one, right? Because I plan to change it later. I'll probably use a glaze. I don't think you should rely on glazes, but I just know that I'm rarely satisfied with my Alla Prima work on its own. Sometimes they turn out great. You know, I'm pleased with them, but. 95% of the time, I'm happier when I really consider each and every step. And I push and pull until it's exactly how I intend it to be. Just, I guess, speaks to a certain temperament. Some artists crank out 30 in a week. That's not me. That's how Van Gogh was. He painted so, so many pictures. Okay, like that. Not worried about t the really small branches at this point. Okay, this kind of turns red, like that. Back to front setting up nicely. So the left hand side of the cylinder is experiencing much more light and the right hand side is in shadow. But I'm going to put this in kind of thinly. This lower part of the tree is getting a lot more environmental light. There's a lot of light bouncing up into it. So it's going to be a lighter value and it's going to gradate from light into dark because this area is not getting much at all. Same with all of the dappled light that's up in this tree. That's going to be much uh, darker because uh, there's a lot, lot less. Art lessons. What mix are you using for these trees? I live in Arizona and it is sometimes challenging mixing the greens. Yeah, greens are notoriously challenging. Um, so the majority of these mixtures are very, very neutral. I start with sap green and then I introduce, you know, a variety of colors like ultramarine blue, titanium white, um, uh, raw umber is in pretty much all of these mixtures and I try to keep things really really neutral and that allows me to push and pull in different areas depending on the need. Um, so I'd say sap green is where I start but I don't know. Greens are mysterious and um, but really, they're no more mysterious than any other color. Uh, something I, I heard recently is to um, try to triangulate your color mixtures or your decisions. So when you look at a color and you're trying to decide what color should I paint this, don't just look at that color. Look in three other spots around the, the canvas. I learned that from Robin Cole, who's a fabulous painter. I just took a workshop with her in Scottsdale. She's friend of mine and gosh I learned so much from that. Um, okay so we're going to switch over to the tree bark mixture. I'm creating this light over here okay and because it's in the light it needs to be warm okay so any warm color will do. Grab some raw umber it needs to be light and I'm um, grabbing some of this Naples yellow and I'm going for an average. If I were to put the light color in a blender, what would it look like? Um, <clears throat> it's close to that, and then I'll be able to adapt as needed. So we're going to try that. Sorry, had to cough. Let's test this out. It's warm, it's light, it's close. Mm hmm. Okay, I think I could go a little bit lighter. Um, and I'm running out of oleo res gel, which is not good because 
right now I'm working in the lights. So well, that's cool. Light, light, light. I'm going to paint nice and thick. I'm using an ivory filbert. And by creating vertical brush strokes, it's mimicking the texture of the tree bark. I'm going to try to retain those brush strokes. So then when I glaze on top of this, or I add subsequent mixtures, I can paint in between those ridges. Okay, and as I go up here, it's going to start gradating, getting a little bit darker. Um, and I kind of like it. It kind of feels a little too white, not warm enough. So I'm going to get more raw umber in this mixture. And I'm going to grab a little bit of green because some of the light is going to be bouncing into this. Most environmental light is experienced in the shadows because secondary light is a lot less intense. Okay, and following the form, it's mixing into the paint on there, already creating that gradation that I wanted. that. Okay. Do you think, uh, let's see, which is, oh yeah, uh, Rob asks, uh, do you think temperatures are important for painting or overhyped? They are very, very important. Um, but, so you don't overwhelm yourself, I want you to think in just two ways. Is it warm or is it cool? So look at your color wheel. Is it Closer to blue or closer to orange? You can start there, but then you can get more specific because really shadows are cool relative to the warm, the warmth of the light. So it doesn't need to be blue and orange. It needs to be, let's say you have orange and it needs to lean blue. So that could be a neutral orange or it could be a gray. Those are all cooler than that original that light. So it is, it is very important. But before you learn that, make sure you learn how to draw. Proportions are more important than that. Okay, so now that I'm entering the shadows, things are going to cool off. And actually it goes from light to a uh, bit closer to the local color. So I'm going to introduce some more brown, raw umber, Van Dyke brown, and a little bit of the green. And notice how lightly I'm holding the paintbrush. I'm letting it just slowly scrape across the surface. So really, I should have painted that branch prior to the other one. Gosling it back and forth, creating some, the illusion of um, uh, dappled light. Okay. If you're just joining now, it would be really helpful. This is the last time I'm going to say it. <laughs> If you could like the video, it really does help. Um, trying to grow the channel. Glad you guys are here. And I love the questions you guys have been asking. If you have any more, please, please ask. They're wonderful. It's funny, some days it's so hard to talk while you're painting. Today you caught me pretty, I, I really like teaching. And when I paint, I'm, or when I'm teaching while I'm painting, I do a lot of talking. Sometimes it works out better than others. Today, I feel like I can talk fairly well. But as I say that, I feel like I'm failing. <laughs> oh, I like that. Okay. Um, there's a, lo a pretty intense local color change on the right-hand side of the tree here. So I'm dipping into some 
transparent red oxide, a little bit of yellow ochre, and I'm going to pull up the side of this tree like that, and it's a little bit too light. So I'm going to reload my brush, and I'm painting very, very thick right now. Very, um, yeah, a lot of texture in this paint. And I'm applying it with a very, very light touch. Going all the way up this branch, letting some of that broken color come through. I like that. I've seen some examples of warm and cool colors in a book. They had warm yellow next to cool yellow, and they had examples of different hues, and honestly, I couldn't see the cool and warm. It takes um, a little bit of time and a little bit of getting used to that concept, so don't worry. You will eventually be able to perceive the subtle differences between cool and warm yellows and cool and warm blues. Um, Start with the most basic. The most basic being, is it closer to orange or closer to blue? And then you can ask yourself, oh, okay, I can see that these yellows are different, but what about them is different? Eventually you'll be able to see that one of them is closer to green and one of them is closer to orange. And that's what it means. Both Yellow itself is a warm color, but when you're looking at just two very, very uh, close, uh, close relationships, there's always a temperature difference. In every single thing that you're looking at, there is a temperature difference. Okay, I'm going to introduce some green into the shadow plane. Just a little bit. Okay, and I'm getting a little bit too uh, light in some of these shadows. Kind of bring them down. And remember, I'd rather it be too light than too dark if I plan to paint on it again. Cool. Let's see. I think my eyes need a lot of training. Everyone's eyes need a lot of training. I really do believe that no one is born with any of these abilities, that it is just training. Some kids just get a lot more practice when they're younger. They're exposed to it more. Um, unless, of course, you're like, Colorblind, which obviously is a disadvantage, uh, but uh, even colorblind people can see value differences, and that's why that's the most important thing to focus on when you're first starting out. Match up here. going to soften everything that's going up above. Some branches up here that need depth of light. I'm just rocking the brush back and forth like this. Creating the illusion of depth of light. Okay, like where this is going. I haven't put the mulch in down here. Maybe I'll do that next. Draw out an ellipse, and ellipses are just ovals. 
just now realizing <laughs> during my class of the Art Students League today in Denver, I was going to discuss ellipses, so I apologize. We got too, too focused on um, a cast drawing today. But we forgot to talk about ellipses. Uh, I think Van Gogh was colorblind. Oh, they think Van Gogh was colorblind. You know what? That's possible. He, his mixtures were just so unique, so different than so many other artists. Um, or, you know, maybe he just liked those colors. I don't know. Okay, I'm creating texture in this mulch as well, but kind of stippling a little bit. Okay, I'm going to scrub into this foreground, kind of create a grassy texture, make it semi-transparent. And I have uh, some of the uh, tree bark mixture into this in my paintbrush some reds, so that should neutralize some of the grass a little bit. Right, because red is the complementary of green. So when you introduce red into green, it makes it less intense, less saturated. Interesting, Van Gogh did the bark course twice. Yeah. That is interesting. They're not, I, I haven't seen his bargs though. I wonder what they looked like. All right, so cylinders should have a soft edge because they're a slow turning form. So I'm gonna go kind of all along the edge of this, this cylinder. I'm gonna soften it relative to the background. And I will also use the back of my brush to scratch into this and kind of create those, um, that gritty vertical texture in the, in the paint. And that way, when I paint on top of it, I'm going to be able to do, paint into these cracks and create kind of a, dirty, um, some detail in those cracks. Sorry, I'm losing, losing it a little bit. <laughs> really liking it. Thank you. Let me take a step back. Yeah, that's looking cool. I like it. Okay, so I'm going to leave this tree alone. I like to develop the whole thing all together. And start to move into uh, some of the highlights in in the tree. Hmm. Interesting. One thing that I haven't included is any pure black. Um, if you're trying to create depth in a piece. You put your darkest note in the foreground, right? So I could place some dark accent down in here, um, which maybe I won't go to pure black, but I could put just a little bit, something really close to it right here. Darken this shadow, and that will create one more tier of depth. So we have this. We have the tree, we have the distance. So I put in a very close to black mixture there, and now I'm kind of blending it in. And the, uh, the camera, of course, the stream makes it look a little bit more uh, higher contrast. So you just know that it isn't quite as dark as what you're seeing. 
introducing some of this into this, into this. I wanted to link these shapes together too. Okay, now I want to integrate these tree branches, so I want some of the foliage to be growing across it and over. And I want the branches that are further away to be softer than the ones that are closer to us. So I'm going to kind of smack them around a little bit when they're further away. This one is so far up against the side of the canvas that I, I don't want you to look at it as much as what's going on down here. So I'll make less contrast on that guy. I can um, work into this background, introducing some of the dark mixture here, using the painting as my palette. And I might want to, mm, it's getting a little warm back there, we'll see. I want to create a little bit more, uh, the illusion of detail in these distant trees. So I'm gonna keep these nice and soft, and I'm thinking of them also as being forms with light and shadow. So there, I'm actually going to assume more shadow on this side and then less on this side, creating a gradation going down. But I want to make sure I'm keeping it cool and pretty light. So I'm rubbing the brush back into the paint here. This has uh, the oleo res gel in it, and it's still really, really, really tacky. So when I scrub into this, it's kind of fighting me a bit. And the darker I make this background, the brighter the tree is going to look. Okay, so I can slowly approach that. Um, I may want to link foreground and background with these leaves like that. And there's a tree here casting this shadow, right? Maybe I could indicate it a little bit. I don't want it to stand out too much. But it creates one more tier of depth. This is the study, so I feel no reservations putting it in. Um, I'm going to get this uh, liner, this little tiny liner brush, and draw out this tree on the side. So to create a nice crisp line, I'm dipping my brush in some Gamsol. And I'm going into a mixture that is not pure black. I think many beginners will go straight in with pure black. And just like with charcoal, and just like with drawing those lines, I'm going to pull the line. And I may actually use scratching to make some of these. I'm being confident with each brush stroke. I'm not hesitating. I'm rolling the brush. And it's coming off um, kind of imperfectly, which I like. And maybe I want a tree way in the distance that's standing tall. So. Maybe there's one here in the foreground. There's one in that um, image. Actually, not sure if I like that. Let's see. 
I can scratch back here and reveal the white of the canvas, giving the illusion of maybe some tree, trees in the distance. And it's probably really hard for you to see. This is this has to be the best color study I've seen. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm really liking it. <laughs> I appreciate that. Creating kind of some of those grooves. It'd be kind of cool if there were some exposed roots. This is the place to experiment. I still experiment on the larger piece, but. Feel no reservations knowing that this is a study for a larger piece. Yeah, I'm liking that. OK, um, we're going to make a bit more detail in these lights. And I may just call this done as a study. So I wouldn't call it absolutely finished, but I like to set it aside and then continue working on it on a later later time, let everything dry, and then maybe I can establish a few more glazes if needed, which usually it is. So I'm creating some variety in the light shape. Not too much. I don't want it to be distracting. And with all of these mixtures being nice and neutral, any sort of saturation will stand out much more than if everything was super saturated. I like to be very selective. That's where Monet and I differ uh, on you know, so many levels. One, he was extremely famous and uh, beloved by so many people. <laughs> but uh, more importantly, and more practically, he put saturation everywhere. Van Gogh put saturation absolutely everywhere. Van Gogh and Monet had texture all over the place. I like to be very, very selective. I think less is more, and it means more, right, when you decide in very particular areas where to, where to place saturated notes. And loose brushwork. I like to have some. Okay. <clears throat> Grab a really dark mixture. I wonder if I want to create tension here at this bottom. This bottom trunk where that's pinching in. Now I could put just black, but I find that if I warm up with like alizarin crimson in the dark accents, it reads as being so, so much more vibrant and the sunlight feels much more intense. I'm pretty sure I read that in Richard Schmidt's Alla Prima 2. That's a book everyone needs to have. If you haven't heard of that, I don't know where you've been, but that book everyone needs. Alla Prima 2 by Richard Schmidt. And in that, he, he was discussing um, light on a summer day. And I'm pretty sure he said you can put warm notes. Like alizarin crimson or even cadmium red down in those deep, deep shadows. And it makes that sun just feel so much more powerful. And I think, speaking, uh, I guess kind of scientifically, I think it's likely that the sun is bouncing or almost radiating into those shadows, or it could be environmental light going into those.
can get away with a lot on trees. Cool. Okay. When you do the main painting, will you match all the colors as closely as possible to the study, and will you pre-mix all of the colors before you start? Yeah. If I'm really, really happy with uh, these relationships, and I feel like, dang, I pretty much nailed it, I will start there, but it, I'll admit, it's very unlikely that this is perfect, right? I'm going to go to sleep tonight, I'll come in, in the studio tomorrow and be like, ah, I really like it, but something just feels off. Something to me feels off with this foreground. It, it looks a little, little too saturated, um, especially on the camera. You guys are experiencing something uh, borderline garish for me. Um, something could change in that foreground. So I'll try either, I'll do an, another s color study. You know what, we'll try something right now. I'm actually going to get really, really light. Too light. Let's just blast this out, adding a lot of white. There, maybe that's it. So it's lighter and actually more neutral because it ha contains a lot more white. Um, Ooh, yeah, maybe create a lot more contrast there, a lot more texture. Okay, this is an option. Maybe I want this light to be more intense. Maybe this to be more intense. By introducing more white, I feel like it harmonizes better with the background. This wraps around the tree. Okay, I like that already a lot better. Okay, so... An example of a color study is this guy that I have hanging on the wall. This was just a really, really quick color study for a figure I did. Um, if you go onto my Instagram, Tanner Steed Art, you can see I just posted the final painting of that. For, I made it uh, for the governor's show. Um, and when I started that painting, I made the premixtures really, really close and created these massive piles of each section because the painting was significantly larger. I think it's 36 by 19. Um, so I started there, and then I slowly pushed and pulled and adapt based on you know, my uh, perception that day. Um, I find that each time I go into the studio, I'm a different person. Um, and maybe we need some Naples yellow, just like little flicks of it in this foreground. A lot more texture here, heavy texture going up to the right. Timothy John, Luke Smith, PSA, Portrait Society of America? Probably, maybe, maybe not. It's great to see you too. Um, I am always working in the studio, so I thought, you know what, why not start doing live streams? Because <laughs> I'm always in here doing something. Oh, I like that. That is already so much better. Captures that diagonal. Now, risk of this is I ran out of oil res gel, so this is going to be drying a lot slower. But that's OK. Don't like that. There we go. Okay, now the one thing that this is lacking based on my original intention was that really strong light in the background, right? I wanted that band of light. Now I could go in and very intricately paint all of these blues to be a heck of a lot darker, um, but um, I think I'm going to wait on that and I'll glaze this whole area to be just a few, few degrees darker and that way this range of clouds back here should glow um, a lot more. Um, but I, I like where, where we are at. Um, yeah, so um, could get up in here. 
and add some of this, the light in the foreground into this tree, creating a bit more excitement in some of these light areas. I think that could be useful. So we'll do that, and then I'm probably going to end the live stream here. Um, if you have any last minute questions, uh, go ahead and ask me real quick. I love the video on Liquin, the best out there. Thank you so much. That's so funny. Um, we were talking about that earlier. If I'm being honest, that video was uh, an, an accident. Um, I was desperate for coming up with an idea for a video, and I looked around the studio, and I was like, oh, I guess Liquin? I use it all the time. I might as well you know, just talk about everything I know. And yeah, it worked out. It just hit 50,000 views, and it says it's still going up. So that's pretty cool. Some drama, na, <laughs> some drama, <na> <laughs> some drama happening there. I love it. Thank you, Diego. Um, yeah, it, it's feeling dramatic. Um, I'm always trying to push that more and more. Maybe the shadow could be a little darker back here, and this tree could be reaching up into that tree. So I'm using this rigor, just kind of scrubbing in this neutral dark mixture. I want that to stand behind the other one. So let's see. Knock some of that back. It's not too clear that this is another tree, though. So I may actually do a single branch like that. Mash it out with my hand. Hmm, not perfect. I'll have to, to fix that one. Okay, and I'm also noticing this tree is not standing clear as being a tree. I could scratch out some of the branches out and point at a similar angle to what's occurring there. Maybe we need some cool, a different green. It's darker, a bit more neutral. Some flicks of it here. Creating a tree kind of in the foreground. We need some darks. So usually I'll start with a photograph and I'll mess around with it in Procreate. It'll get to a pretty cool spot, I'll feel like, yeah, this could be a painting. And then I start working on a color study like this, and then uh, I start working intuitively, and things like this just start to take over. So maybe this tree is creating a diagonal just like that. But super subtle. I don't want you to look at this painting and see this tree on the side more than you see the tree above. may not be necessary. This may be excluded in the larger piece, this tree on the side. It's kind of distracting. Um, where's your favorite spot to plant our paint, Colorado? This painting looks great. You found this tree's character. Thank you. Um, my favorite spot to paint in Colorado. I love Rocky Mountain National Park. I love going up to the mountains, bringing my paint box. Um, and you know, Emerald Lake is just stunning. Anywhere up there could be a painting. Um, but truly, I don't have to go far to be satisfied with a painting location. Anything could be cool. This is like a 15 minute drive from my place, um, just downtown. And it, you can find paintings anywhere. So I didn't have to go far. Let's see. 
What do you think of Utrecht Artist Oil Paints? Um, I have not used many of them. I have a blue that's lasted a little bit too long. They're, they're good. I've heard they used to be uh, like a really high quality paint company um, and that they were bought out by uh, Dick Blick and the recipe seems to be very similar so it could still be of a very high quality. So that's, that's great. I have nothing to say bad, nothing bad to say with them. So I say go for it. If you like them, do it. Okay. If anyone is interested in buying this painting, let me know. I like it a lot, actually. This, it's exciting. It's going to work as a, a big one. Sometimes I do a color study, and I'm like, eh, you know, it's okay. This one, I, I can tell. It's going to work. I saved a heck of a lot of paint. You save a lot of paint when you do color studies, and you realize, you know, that's not going to work. It's a larger piece. All right. So... Uh, I think we're going to call that a study. So thank you so much for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you will return. I uh, do a live stream at least once a week, and I'm starting back up with some of my regular videos. I just uh, did a uh, video. I, I recorded a video uh, talking about all, everything about painting details. Let me start over. Good God. <laughs> um, I'm painting an extremely complicated subject. It's um, pa a paisley pattern on a tapestry. And I think I've developed a pretty solid system that uh, if you uh, were also painting something that is extremely complicated, to simplify it and uh, get into the details. Oh, you know you need to stop when you just say, just one more brush stroke, one more, let's, okay, truly one, just a few more. I'm going to put in some ultramarine blue, some really saturated notes in here, just for fun, just to see what happens. Okay. I love the colors, that's why I said it was dramatic, haha, -ha. until next time. Thanks, man. Thanks for being here. Um.